Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Markov Processes. How is the homework going? Is everybody okay? I uh, just today got, uh, so we have a TA, Evan, and um, he's going to hold office hours. He just gave me his office hours and he's going to have some on Wednesday for last minute stuff. I have office hours tomorrow. Uh, email me in the meantime if you have any questions and uh, I will get Evan's link and office hours posted right after class. Um, so if you have x0, x1, et cetera, iid, independent and identically distributed, if you're looking at the probability that xn plus 1 is some j given xn is i down through x0 is some i0, by definition, this is the probability that xn plus 1 is j and xn is i down through x0 is i0 over the probability that xn is i down through x0 is i0. And then by independence, you can break this up into a probability times a probability times a probability over a probability times a probability times a probability. And then all of these are going to cancel up until here. And so you end up with the probability that xn plus 1 is j. And what I, I kind of, the hiccup I had at the beginning was this equaling this is actually how I define independence. Uh, I don't define it in the intersection way. Uh, if this is independent of these, then having this information means nothing. And the, this probability is just the probability without it. But yeah, if we're going strictly by you know the, the usual intersection definition, um, then we can show that this is equal to this. And, and so on the other hand, if you start with the probability that xn plus 1 is j, given xn is i, by independence, this is the probability that xn plus 1 is j. And so we did get the same thing <laughs> out of both conditional probabilities. Oops, that should have been circled. Out of both conditional probabilities. Yeah. OK, so uh, really briefly, I, well, I say that, and who knows what's brief. I, but I didn't want, I don't want to spend a long time on this. I want to get to some exciting stuff today. So this is the part that I call a longer history in a Markov framework. This is not something that I find myself using very much because if you really have a much longer history, this is going to be really not, um, I'm in trouble with words today. It's not going to be efficient. But um, I've got widgets on an assembly line. And they are uh, either good or defective. And so I'm going to call them uh, capital G or D. And then because of some raw material going into the widget making machine, maybe defective ones are going to clump up because the raw material is bad. And so I'm going to make up something here where I say, like, if the last two are defective, um, the next will be defective with some probability. Let's say um, 0.3. So WP with probability 0.3. And um, if the last two were good, the next will be good with maybe some high probability because we expect these good ones to kind of be clumped together. It's, it's such a made up example. I guess we don't expect anything. So if the last two are good, the next is good. Why did I use the abbreviation there and not there? Good with probability 0.9. And I have not fully described this. So if the last was defective and the one before that was good, let's say the next is defective with some probability like 0.2. I hate this time spending <laughs> writing out the so-called word problem, but I think the hardest part of this problem is writing down the matrix from the words. So I have one more bullet. And that is, if the last was good, but the one before that was defective, the next will be good with probability 0.6. So I want to ask some questions like, um, 
if the last two are defective, what is the probability the next two will be good? You know, things that aren't given by these statements. And this is not exactly Markovian because where we go next depends on not where we were, but where we were and where we were the day before, or not, these aren't days. So the last two. But if we redefine the states, then we'll be just fine. So um, we can talk about a new state space that consists of like where we are currently and where we were the day before. So something like like good and good, I'll make like ordered pairs, good and defective, defective and good, and defective, effective. And so this is like uh, today. And why do I keep saying days? These are widgets on an assembly line and raw materials are going in. So this is the uh, current item on the assembly line. And the previous, and then we're talking about going to the next. <laughs> and so what we're going to have are things like going from good, good to good defective, but there always has to be this overlap because this is current and this was previous. And then the current is becoming previous. Right, so this is the, I don't even know if writing this is, is worth it. It's, it's looking confusing. This is the new previous, which was the old current. My point is that these must be the same for this chain. And so a transition matrix would look something like this. So I'm gonna have a good, 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 defective, defective, good, defective, defective, and same stuff up here. And so what do we know? The first bullet I wrote was if the last two are defective, the next will be defective with probability 0.3. So that's like going defective, 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 and moving from this pair to this pair. And maybe by drawing it that way, you can see that the one in the middle has to be common between both pairs. And that was probability 0.3. And so that probability is gonna go right here in the lower right corner of the matrix. Um, this would be maybe how I'd represent a move from defective, defective to defective, defective. It's really only three days. What is with me and the days? There are no days here. I'm gonna fix this right now and say our machine produces one widget every day. <laughs> and now I can talk about days. Okay, so um, from defective, defective, this last day or widget has to be the first day or widget that we go to. So I either can go here or here. I cannot go here and here. So this probability is going to be zero. This probability is going to be zero. And the remaining probability is going to be the remaining probability of 0.7. The second bullet was if the last two were good, the next will be good with probability 0.9. I'll make myself some room down here. So this is good, good to good, good, but really it represents three days. Like a, a good here and good here and a good here. So you're going from this grouping to this grouping. And again, the one in the middle has to be, you know, the one that ends one ordered pair has to start the next ordered pair. And so if we're good the next day with probability 0.9, that's gonna go up here and this final good has to match the first state here. So these are definitely zero. And then the good defective one is the rest of the probability. Okay, so the third bullet, if the last was defective, but the one before that was good. So the last was defective, the one before that was good. The next will be defective with probability 0.2. So good defective to defective defective is what we're talking about with that 0.2. And so good defective to defective defective, that 0.2 probability is going to be up here. From good defective, since we're ending in effective, the next state has to start in defective. So it can only be this one, which we've already covered, or this one, which means the remaining 0.8 probability will go here. 
And these can't happen because of that overlap day. Okay, I'm just gonna fill in the next row. So the next, uh, the third row is 0 0.6, 0 0.400. 0. Okay, so yeah, let's let's try to answer some actual questions for this problem. Um, question one is um, given that the last two days were defective. Oh, I'm just saying days. I'm just saying days. The last two widgets, the last two were defective. What is the probability that the next one is good? This is directly off the matrix. This is a defective defective to um, defective good. This is a three days. These three slots are three days. And I have defective, defective, and the next day is good. So I'm going from this pair of states to this pair of states. And that is right on the matrix. It is the 0.7. So the answer is 0.7. Okay, let's do something more interesting. So given that the last two are defective, so the same setup, what is the probability that the next two are good? And so if days are like slots here that I wanna fill in, we're going from defective, defective to good, good, but it's really two moves from defective, defective, to defective, good, to good, good. So this is defective, defective, to defective, good, to good, good. There's a couple ways to answer this. The first thing is I wanna say that this doesn't involve the square of the matrix necessarily. It will turn out to work in this case, but you shouldn't be thinking square of the matrix because that's when you're skipping something and nothing is being skipped. This is really two transitions. The, the answer here is gonna be the transition probability of going from defective defective to defective good, which is 0.7. And then defective good to good, which is 0.6. So this is the final answer. Again, I did not use the two-step transition matrix because that's for skipping steps. However, it will work in this case because there happens to be only one way to go from defective, defective to good, good in two steps. So yes, you can take the defective, defective to good, good entry of the two-step matrix. But again, that's because there's only one way to, to do this journey in two steps. So you have to be careful about that. Really, you should think square matrix when you're skipping time steps. Okay, so my final one before getting out of this horrible example that I'm just not enjoying for some reason, so I can't imagine you are. Um, the last one was defective and the one before that was good. I want to know the probability of at least one defective in the next three days widgets. <laughs> so what is the probability of at least one defective in the next three? So the picture, the slots, kind of like we've got defective and before that we have good and then we want at least one defective in these next three slots. So there's many ways to write that down, but there is a complement here. The probability um, that we want is maybe more easily written, definitely is more easily written as one minus the probability that, now this is gonna be abusive notation, the probability that we see the sequence good, defective, good, 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 right? That's, that's the only way to not have a defective. So this is a complement, but I said that's an abusive notation because really this probability I wrote should be good defective to defective good to good good to good good. And those are the transitions that we can read off the matrix. 
and multiply them because the Markov chain, it doesn't have independent values at different time steps, but it does have independent transitions. So the good defective to defective good is the 0.8. All right, I've got these. So this is going to be 0.8. And that defective good to good good is the 0.6. And the good good to good good is 0.9. Um, that was, I don't know, I'm sorry, I didn't do that justice at all, but that was really boring. Um, the point was just to, uh, you can stuff a longer history into a Markov framework, and you have to kind of think about this overlap. And the actual problems we solved are not all that important because they're not really the kinds of quintessential canonical problems. You could be asked a number of things here. So I'm not sure that these knowing these particular solutions are helpful to you, but knowing how you can stick a longer history into a Markov framework could be helpful. So this is a squiggly line. That's my kind of thought break. We're moving on to something else. I would like you to consider the following transition matrix on the state space zero. How do we start from zero? Three, all right, one, two, three, four. So consider the transition matrix. And I'm going to have states one, two, three, and four. And going across the top row, I have 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.4. Going across the next row, I have 0 and 0 0.5 and 0 0.4 and 0 0.1. Going across the third row, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, 0, and 0 0.3. And the final row, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.7, and 0 0.1. It's not really important that you get all these exactly right. I have a matrix. OK, so here I am in R, and I have input the matrix. So if you are still trying to write that down, here is the matrix again. <laughs> And I want to start taking powers of the matrix. And I want to take many powers. And it could be a little clunky in R. So I just wrote a script. So the next thing you're going to see is the square. Uh, no, the matrix. The next thing you're going to see is the square of the matrix. So obviously changing. The next thing you're going to see is the cube of the matrix. Woohoo! Now the matrix to the fourth power. Wow. OK, the matrix to the fifth power, 6, 7, 8, 9. Do you notice anything? <laughs> yeah, you do. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Denali. Um, the columns seem to be settling down to constants. It looks like going to the first column is always going to happen with probability 0.289-ish, no matter where you start. And so what's happening here, what you're seeing right here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor going around it, um, but what you're seeing in this first column is it looks like no matter where I start, I will go to state one with probability 0.289-ish. And no matter where I start, I will go to state two with probability 0.1666-ish. <laughs> it appears that this Markov chain is settling down and no matter where you start, if you keep taking powers, you are going to end up kind of in the limit at state one, two, three, and four with certain probabilities. That's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing limiting probabilities for a Markov chain. And that's what we're interested in talking about now when this limit exists and how we can find it. Um, you know, analytically with not without, you know, taking powers of a matrix, especially that's going to be especially important when we go to a continuous state space and continuous time powers of the matrix is not going to work for us there. But we are seeing a kind of long run proportion of time will be in state one, two, three, and four. Exciting, exciting. And now we're going to be less exciting for a little while because we want to talk about this limiting distribution, when it exists, and how to find it. But in order for us to, to come up with scenarios where it exists, we need a bunch of vocabulary. I'm getting ready to set up some theorems to say, if your Markov chain is this and this and has this property, then this limit is going to exist. And if it exists, here's how we're going to find it. 
So the motivation for what we're about to do next is this idea of a limiting distribution, but we've got a bunch of definitions and things to go through. So I just want to say that one more time in a picture, um, if you have states one, two, three, and four, it seems like no matter where you start, if you ran um, for a long, long time and get out here to oops, get out here to time infinity, that you are going to end up at state one, state two, state three, and state four with just these precise probabilities, regardless of where you started, because the Markov chain has run so long it doesn't remember where it starts. Yeah, so there's like a distribution of values at time infinity that we want to see. And most MCMC, MCMC stands for Markov Chain Monte Carlo, most algorithms um, really have you simulating things for a long time, like 5 million time steps, and then saying, I'm going to grab the distribution there, and that is close enough to infinity. Um, but there is some statistical error there. And towards the end of the class, when we talk about perfect simulation, I'm going to show you how you can get to infinity in a finite number of steps. So when does this limiting distribution exist and how are we going to find it? Here's where we're going to go into just a kind of some definitions for a while. The first is about, um, so this is, I'll call this like towards formalizing a limiting distribution. And the first thing is um, we're going to talk about how we can classify states as ones that are revisited often or not. So I'll call this classification of states. OK, so for my first trick, I'm going to define um, what it means for a state to be able to be reached from another state. So we say that state J in a Markov chain can be reached from state I if you can get there with some positive probability in some number of steps. Now, it doesn't have to be one step. So can be reached from state I if the probability you go from I to J in n time steps, so that's that p sub i j super n, is positive, so greater than 0 for some integer n greater than or equal to 0. You can get there. It may not be in one step, but you can get there. And we write i and then like a right arrow j. and it's not a mistake that I wrote n equals 0. So that is actually something that I think is a lot like 0 factorial. It, it's one of those things that just makes everything work out neatly. <laughs> Why is 0 factorial 1? Um, you know, I, I kind of believe that we are discovering math and not inventing it, but that, that one, not so sure about. <laughs> we define 0 factorial be 1 just to make things work out nicely. And that's what's going on here, in my opinion. So. This is saying that uh, a state can always be reached from itself, even if you cannot ever get to that state, even if you're at that state and you definitely move away with probability one and can never get back. Because you're allowed to do this in zero time steps, then every state can be reached from itself because the probability you go from say I to I in zero time steps is always one and that's greater than zero. So even if there's no actual method of going from that state to the other state, it still technically can be reached from itself. Oh, awesome. Thank you for that. Check the chat for a, a class Discord channel. OK, so the um, another definition is if we can get from i to j, in other words, j can be reached from i, and um, we can get from j to i, the states are said to communicate. And we write, when we want to say this, i with a double arrow j. Uh, again, we're headed towards that limiting distribution. And I'm getting ready to set up a bunch of theorems like, if all states communicate, then, you know, so these are a bunch of little definitions to help us establish the theorems for that limiting distribution. 
Okay, so communication, the concept of communication is an equivalence relation. If you don't know what that is, you're about to know what that is. Um, but that some of you, I'm sure, especially if you come from pure math, um, we've got these three properties that are that are satisfied. So communication is an equivalence relation. And what that means is number one, I'm going to call it I. It has a reflexive property. And this means, oops, reflexy. Reflexive property. And this means that a state I communicates with itself. And we know this holds by definition because of that funky definition we did. It's just by definition, it communicates with itself. Um, we've got a, a, a symmetry property or symmetric. And so um, if I communicates with J, then J is going to communicate with I. And that also is kind of by definition, right? Because if you can get from I to J and you can get from J to I, then you can get from J to I and you can get from I to J. So this is also really uh, by definition. Third one, I know some of you know it's coming, is the transitive property. I'm just going to write transitive. I guess if I wanted to follow what I was writing, it would be transitivity. And so this property is going to be actually cute for us to compute and a good proof to watch because you're going to use this technique in a lot of things you want to prove in this class. So if I communicates with J and J communicates with another state K, then I communicates with K. And that sounds perfectly reasonable and intuitive but let's see how we actually might go about proving this. And again, this is a proof you're gonna need kind of a lot, this technique. So let's prove it. Okay, so um, because we have I communicating with J and J communicating with K, this implies that there exists some integers. So there exists integers, n and m and two more <laughs> that I don't need yet, such that I can get from i to j in n time steps with some positive probability, and I can get from j to k in m time steps with some positive probability. And the two more means that I can go the other way, because really all I need is for j to be reachable from I and K to be reachable from J in order to, to get this. So this two-way thing is actually guaranteeing me four time steps, right? I could go the other way. I just don't care about those right now. <laughs> and so what do I wanna show? I wanna show that I can get from I to K and then I will have a symmetric argument to say that I can get from K to I and then we'll be done. So check this out. If you consider the probability of going from I to K in N plus M steps, I can use the chapman kolmogorov equations to say that I'm gonna go from I to J, sorry, not J, I'm gonna go from I to some intermediate state L. Now that's weird, I make it a curly L because just can be confused for other symbols that I chicken scratch on the board. I can go from I to some L in N steps and then from L to K in the remaining M steps. And I can run over all L in the state space. And who knows if we can move around the state space or not very well. I do know that I can do this at least one way. So all of these probabilities might be zero, but this is, um, this is, oops, sorry. This is greater than or equal to 
the one term that we do know we have positive probabilities for, the term where you plug in L equals J. So this is greater than or equal to the probability of going from I to J in N units of time, and the probability of going from J to K in M units of time, because at least one term is non-zero in there. And this is strictly positive. So we have shown that we can find an integer number of steps for which we can go from I to K with a strictly positive probability. So we have just shown that from I, we can get to K. And then it's just the same argument to go the other direction. It's just that you won't use the same N and M. It's just because you can go from I to J and N steps does not mean you can go from J to I and N steps. So really the communication between I and J says there is some N that you can go from I to J in that number of steps. And there is some other, you know, other integer. I can't think of another letter, but there's another integer for going back. So um, use a similar argument to show that from K you can get to I, and then you're done showing communication between I and K. And my proof there. That Chapman Kolmogorov pull out a single term trick is something I think you're going to find quite useful in a lot of cases. So if you want to start at some i and end at some k in n plus m units of time, you can just like break this up anywhere. And I broke it up at n units of time. And you could just sort of condition on where you go at that time. And you can go somewhere and then, well, the path's not going to look like that, but you can go somewhere and then you can get to K. And if you sum over all the possible places where you could have been at time N, that's like it's conditioning on where you are at time N and then summing over all of those to get rid of it. But the thing I box is at the top of the screen is actually the definition of the chapman kolmogorov equation. So those of you who have seen an equivalence relation might know where I'm headed. And that is, I want to define some equivalence classes. So anything that is equivalent to anything else goes in the same class. And because equivalence for us is, is centered around this concept of communication, for us, these are going to be called communication classes. So an equivalence relation allows you to partition a, a space of, of objects into classes. In, in general, they're known as equivalence classes. But for us, since it's communication, we're going to call them communication classes. So basically, we say if two states communicate, they get put into the same class. And we're going to do an example in just a couple of minutes. Now, it actually may be possible to move from one class of states to another. But if you can do that, you won't be able to move back. So if you imagine like this as a as like containing a state I and a state J and they're in one class and some other states over here, if they're separate classes, that means that I and J and K don't all communicate. It may be possible to go from J to K, but it's sure not or it may be possible to go from any other state. So maybe another state over here to K, you can go from one class to another, but then you can't get back because if you could get back, you know, all the states in here, you can run between in some number of steps, they all communicate and all of these as well. And so if there's an arrow going back, then actually everything communicates and it should have been one big class. I don't know if that makes sense, but it should feel better after we do an example. So before the example, just have a quick definition. A Markov chain, my MC there is Markov chain, is said to be irreducible if all states communicate or if there's just one communication class. I think as a practical matter, it's easier. The definition should be if all states communicate. 
but the, the idea of it being irreducible, you could think of breaking down the state space into different classes. So there's one class. And if it's not irreducible, we call it reducible. Remember, again, we are trying to come up with some theorems or sufficient conditions to see a limiting distribution. And we have launched into a bunch of definitions. So you're going to see theorems eventually that say, assume the Markov chain is irreducible and this and that. Like we're, we're setting up the, the sufficient conditions for a limiting distribution. So let's just do an example of finding communication classes. I don't know what to say. I don't envy you writing this down. I need to have quite a few states so that we have options. Um, so I'm going to have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I'm going to make my matrix P, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And for anyone trying to write and not look up, I'm about to read off the top row. It's going to be 1 third, 0, 2 thirds, 0, 0, 0. While I'm here, let me put the column headings on. And what I want to do is find all communication classes. This is not fun to do by hand, but that's exactly what we're going to do. If the matrix were more complicated, especially if it were denser, I, I don't know who's going to ask you to find all communication classes, honestly, but I would probably start looking at powers of the matrix in MATLAB or something. For now, let's just see where we can go from where and to where. So I'm going to start with this as a bracket, and I'm going to put state zero in there. And let's just figure out, this is kind of brute force-ish. Force, brute force -ish. Um, from zero, I can go to zero. Well, that is totally unimportant, because zero always communicates with itself by definition. Uh, from zero, I can go to two. Now, can I get back? Turns out I can get back in one step. You don't have to be able to get back in one step. You just have to be able to get back following some path. But for this simple matrix, it's pretty clear, quote unquote, clear that you can get back and that zero and two communicate. So they should fall into the same class. And from two, I can go to zero and to two, and that's it. And so if you really just hone in on the zero and two rows, it becomes kind of clear to you that when you're at zero or two, you're stuck in that little set and you're not going anywhere else, nor is anything else. Well, you're not going anywhere else. <laughs> I can't say what I was going to say, which is nothing else is going to two, because that's not true. From three, you can go to two. But I am going to close this class, and I'm going to take the next number that's not in a class, which is one. Uh, from one, I can go to one. Who cares about that? From one, I can go to three. Does one communicate with three? Only if from three, I can go to one. It's easy to see I can do that in one step here, but again, it doesn't have to be in one step. You just have to be able to get back. But because I can see it right away in one step, one and three communicate. Uh, from three, I can get anywhere. So what's going to communicate with three? Anything that I can get back to three from. This is definitely clunky. Um, so let, let me do one more here. Um, from three, I can go to zero, right? But from zero, I can only go to two. And from two, I can only go to zero. So I'll never get back. And that's why three does not communicate with zero. Um, from three, I can go to one. I already have that. From three, I could go to two. But from two, I'll be stuck in the zero two set. Um, from three, I can go to four. From four, I can go back to three. Once again, this is becoming an unfortunate example because I can do that in one step. So from three, I can go to four. And even if the four to three entry is zero, as long as there's some path back, I can say three and four communicate. Three and four communicate. I'm just going to finish this off because really it's a matter of staring at it for a while and thinking about possibilities. And it might be helpful to draw a like a, a state space diagram. I sometimes find these helpful where you like make these nodes and maybe draw arrows to see how you can get from one to another. Or you can start looking at powers of the matrix 
And you'll eventually see that from zero uh, and from two, you will definitely never go anywhere else in any number of steps if you start looking at powers of the matrix. So this is kind of ugly. This is really a brute force approach. And I just want to emphasize again, states communicating does not mean you can go between them necessarily in one step. Just happened here. OK, so these states have classifications. Um, we, state, we say that um, a state is recurrent if, when you start at that state, you will return um, with probability 1. So state i is said to be recurrent if starting from i, you will re eventually return with probability 1. It may take a really long time, but as long as uh, you will return, then it's said to be recurrent. And then if it's not recurrent, it's said to be transient. So um, a state that is not recurrent is called a transient state. And although it's everything that you will not return to with probability one, finding states that do that is kind of difficult. Um, an easier way to find that something is transient is a state is transient if there is a positive probability of escape. So this is actually equivalent to what I just wrote. So a state is transient if there is a positive probability of escape, not to be dramatic, but never to return again. I just, yeah, who am I kidding? I want it to be dramatic. I think it's much easier to show something is transient using that definition because all you need to do is find a path that will take you away from that state to a place where you can never return again. So let's look at the states that we have. Let's look at our previous matrix. Because I can go, let's see, where can I go? Because I can go from state three to state two, and once I'm at state two, I'm stuck in here, you can see that three is transient. There is a way out never to return again. And in fact, because all these states communicate, that forces the rest of them to be transient. Because if I started at state five, I know that in some number of steps, I can get to state three. They're in the same communication class. And I know there is a way to go from three to two, never to return again. <laughs> so although that I think that might make perfect sense, we're going to prove that transients and recurrence are so-called class properties. And this means that if state I is transient, for example, and I communicates with J, then J is also transient. That's what it means to be a class property. So both states in here are recurrent. And this might not be believable. Uh, we've got this little two by two matrix to consider. Ignore the one row and column there. You can see we're just kind of flipping back and forth between zero and two. And you might imagine me putting some really extreme probabilities in here, like 0.999 in here and 0 0.001 in here, and then maybe two to two is also 0.9. So it may, it may be that if you're at state zero with a very high probability, you move to two. And with a very high probability, you stay at two. But as long as there's a chance to escape, we can show and we will show that you will eventually come back around to zero, even if it seems unlikely. So we're going to prove that. But it's much easier to show something as transient, because all you have to do is demonstrate a sample path that takes you away, never to return again. So they are class properties. Again, I will prove that. But we, we can call the entire class recurrent and this entire class transient. So this class and all of the states in it are recurrent. And this other class and all the states in it are transient. And we have to prove this stuff, but 
Is there something I can clear up at this point? That is an excellent question. If you have a finite state space, you have to have at least one that is recurrent. But because you can't leave all states forever, <laughs> you have to keep you have to land somewhere. Um, but there are examples of infinite state spaces where you can leave all states forever. I'm just going to do this really brief here. I'm not going to write it out formally. We're going to spend like a whole lecture on this. Um, there is the idea of a, a random walk, which can be defined in many ways, but usually it's like up one with probability P and down one with probability one minus P. And we're going to prove that um, if P is one half, that starting at any state I, you may wander away, but you'll eventually come back. But if P is greater than one half or less than one half, you're actually going to wander away for good. So if an infinite, you have an infinite state space, it is possible for everything to be transient. By the way, in this example, all states communicate because I just go up one and down one. So it may take a long time, but I can technically get from any state to any other state. So once we prove that transients and recurrence are class properties to show that all states are transient. We only have to show that one state is transient. But yes, for a finite state space, you need at least one recurrent state because there's no way to escape all states forever. And by the way, because of this class property business, if you have a finite state space that is irreducible, all states are recurrent. Let me write that down. So I did define irreducibility as all states communicate or there's just one class. So I want to say an irreducible Markov chain on a finite state space has to have all of its states being recurrent. Let me, I don't know, man, I'm having problems wording things today. I'm really sorry about today. It's not very, it seemed very organized. Um, a Markov chain on a finite state space has to have at least one recurrent state. It's just, you just can't escape all states forever. And then if it's irreducible, there's just one communication class, everything communicates, and we are going to prove that recurrence is a class property. So the next thing I want to say is if you have an irreducible Markov chain on a finite state space, the entire chain, just like we call the classes recurrent or transient, you know, we define recurrence and transients for states, but then we say everything in the class has to be one or the other. So let's call the class recurrent or transient. Here we have one big class. So the entire chain is recurrent. Right now I'm stating these as things that should feel like they make sense. We do need to prove these things. But you know, if you have an irreducible Markov chain on a finite state space, a finite state space means you can't escape forever. And if we show that, that uh, recurrence is a class property, everything that communicates with a recurrent state must also be recurrent. In the irreducible case, everything communicates. So yes. For an infinite state space, it is possible for the entire Markov chain to be transient. And we're going to do that example. To prove some of this stuff, I need yet more notation and definitions. So next up is going to be the definition of a first hitting time on a state. I'm going to call this the first hitting time on state i. The setup is we have a Markov chain on discrete time, discrete state space. I'm going to call this T sub i, and it's going to be the minimum time step. So the minimum of all integers n greater than or equal to zero for which x sub n equals i. It's just the first time the chain hits i, and a hitting time uh, usually includes zero. 
time zero. So if you start at I, you have already hit state I. And then if we don't want to talk about time zero, we can talk about, well, return times. So a first return time to state I, um, you know, everyone does it. And not that that's a good reason to do something, but I don't want to um, force too much of my personal notation on you. I think you should be able to go out in the world and read Markov papers and Markov books. So usually TI is used here as well. This is the minimum at times greater than or equal to one for which XN is I, but that alone does not define it. This has to be in the context of, so when we're starting at I, when X zero is I. If you start at I, when is the first time you return to I? And this, you have to take at least one step. It's not, okay, you're already at I, you know, it, it's actually a return. So I guess they usually say it makes sense, but those are just definitions. I'm going to, I'm going to formalize recurrence now. I'm going to let, I'm going to consider this second sort of time, which looks like a return time, but it really doesn't until I specify that X zero was I. I'm going to let TI be the first or the smallest integer N greater than or equal to one for which XN is I. I'm going to let, this is a lowercase g. So this is going to be a probability. And it's really tempting to want to call this p sub i, but there's way too many p's floating around in Markov processes. So I'm going to call it something else. This is going to be the probability that starting at i, the process will return eventually, will eventually return in some finite time. And so in symbols, GI is going to be the probability that that first return time to state I is finite given that we start at state I. So that's how we write that out formally. I won't start using this for a while um, because I wanna make sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. But because we are often going to have statements like this conditioning on where we're starting, another commonly used notation is to write like p sub i, ti less than infinity. In a Markov chain context, if you see like a p sub i, like a probability written with a subscript, that means that you're starting at i. Also, the expected time to first return to i, given you're starting at i, can be written like this. So this is notation for the expected time to return to i, given that x0 is i. So I'm not going to use it for a while, but when you see this subscript notation on probabilities and expectation in a Markov context, it means that's where you're starting your chain. OK, so with our new notation, we now actually have a formal definition of recurrence and transience. Definition. State I is recurrent if GI is 1. Otherwise, it's transient. Now, GI is a probability, so it's always between 0 and 1. Um, but yeah, state I is transient if GI is strictly less than 1. So there are formal definitions for you. OK, so if you have a transient state, you eventually will drift away forever. You may come back and hit it quite a lot, but eventually you'll, you'll escape never to return again. A recurrent state, you are coming back. And you can come back relatively quickly, or it could take a really long time. In fact, for a recurrent state, the expected time it takes to come back could be infinite. <laughs> Sounds a little nuts. You will return, but it'll take a really long time. And the whether or not the time to return to a recurrent state, you don't have to write this down. I will eventually write this all out. 
Whether or not the expected return time to a recurrent state is finite or infinite, uh, we can break down recurrent states into another subdivision. So how could you have an infinite expected return time? You can imagine, um, I don't know if you've seen like, like a Cauchy distribution, that's a continuous distribution. It's a kind of bell curve. It has a PDF, it integrates to one, everything's nice and finite, but the tails of that distribution are so fat that the average value, actually that expectation integral is um, diverges, is undefined, it has an infinite expectation. You can have finite things with an infinite expectation. I know that might seem weird. We'll see examples. So I think the last thing I can do today is what I really want to do next, but I need to review something, is a transient state. If you start with a transient state I, I'm claiming you'll eventually leave forever. So we could talk about maybe the expected number of times we're going to hit that state before we leave forever. And to do this, we're going to need the geometric distribution. So I just want to remind you about the geometric distribution. This is where you have a sequence of independent trials of an experiment. And each trial can result in one of two possible outcomes. Let me make that its own bullet of an experiment. Each trial has two possible outcomes. We call them success or failure. which I'm going to abbreviate as S or F. And in part of the setup is the probability of success needs to be the same from trial to trial. So I'm gonna let this little lowercase b be the probability of success on any one trial. If you've had even like a minimal prerequisite for this course, I'm sure you've seen this before, but it's okay if you don't know it. So we can define a random variable in two ways, many ways, but there's two I want to consider here. One is the number of trials up to and including the first success. And the other is the number of failures before the first success. And both of these are examples of geometric distributions. So I'm going to let Right now we care about the failure one. I'm gonna let X be the number of failures before the first success. So note that X can take on the value zero, right? If you see success right off the bat. So it can take on the values zero, one, two, on up. Whereas if we define X to be the number of trials up to and including the first success, then X can take on, can't take on the value zero anymore. So the probability mass function, we wanna look at the probability that like X equals zero, one, two, and, and so on. The probability that X is zero, this is the probability of success on the first trial. And that just happens with probability P. I'm gonna get kind of messy because I'm out of time. Let me write just one more line. Probability that X is one is the probability of a failure and then a success. So I should probably write failure on the first trial and success on the second trial, but the trials are independent. So this is just the probability of failure on the first trial times the probability of success on the second trial. But those probabilities aren't changing from trial to trial. So no one cares if you wrote on the first trial or on the second trial, this is one minus P and P. I have to pick up there next time, but we're going to use the geometric distribution to figure out the expected number of times you return to a transient state before you are lost forever. How exciting is that? Please come back. <laughs>